Hello, welcome to Toffee TV, to the match preview, Aston Villa versus Everton. First game after the international break, and obviously, Jack, it's going to be a tough one. Villa have started decent. One defeat, obviously, at home in their last home game against Arsenal, but a good side, and it's going to be potential to be a tough day. Yeah, it's going to be difficult, isn't it? I think even if we do manage to get a result, we are going to have to work for it because they are a very good side. They've got a lot of attack and talent. And again, they've had another good summer window where they've strengthened again after doing well for the 18 or so months they've had under Emery. And mm. they just seem to go from strength to strength, don't they? And obviously that makes things difficult for us in a game that isn't must win because it's so early in the season, but it would be a massive boost for Everton to win. Yeah, I mean, you say it's not a must win, is it? I mean, in terms of because we can't honestly sit here and say we are we are going to win it, or you know, it's going to be difficult. Obviously, Villa, we haven't beaten in the Premier League since they come back up. Um, become a little bit of a bogey side, to be honest. Last season, early on, they dispatched this quite comfortably. I mean, I think that was the that was very much a day where. We had to have a good look at our team, even though it was early on. And it it might be similar. I don't know. That day we didn't have Jared Brantwaite and that sort of ushered in Jared Brantwaite into the first team. And we are waiting for him again. We don't don't think he's going to be available for this game. The manager said he's back on the grass. But what I, what I will say is he did say similar things about James Garner um, and and Seamus Coleman recently. And, and they, they were back a lot quicker than we thought they were. But... Villa have, have become, as you said, they're a very, very good side. Do you think we can... I mean, I think I know your answer this, to this, but should we be using them as the example for where we are right now and where they were a couple of years ago? To what is actually capable if you get everything, and I mean everything, right at your football club in a very short amount of time? Yeah, well, without trying to sound too over the top, they are the example, they are the inspiration to underperform and big mm. clubs like Everton, who showed that obviously money's been spent there, you can't yeah. skate around that, but money's been spent at Everton over the years, yeah, not yeah. recently, but a few years ago. The difference is they spent their money well, yeah. and that shows you the difference that can be made, but in such a short space of time as well, and obviously they have lost key players over that period, the lost Jack mm. Grealish, Douglas Louise going in the summer, but it doesn't seem to really phase them because the recruitment in terms of bringing players in has been so good as well. And mm. around the time they appointed Emery, they were in a similar position to us around the time we appointed um, Sean Dyche, obviously, mm. as well. The difference is they kept winning and they haven't stopped winning and they carried that into Champions League football last season. So it, yeah. it does show that it is possible, and you know maybe you could mention Newcastle as well, although they obviously fell off in their second season, which is what Villa are trying mm -hmm. to avoid, and that's what they've strengthened for again this year. But they've shown that you can do it. You just need to hit all your targets. Yeah, both clubs have shown that it can be turned around. And I only say that because in light of what John Texter has said this week, whether you agree, whether you don't agree... Um, and whether you believe that he will, he will take over Everton. Any any uh, prospective owner should should be thinking like that, and can be thinking like that. That a that a proper football club like Aston Villa can, if they do things right, if they get the right people in. You just mentioned there they sack Steven Gerrard um, before that World Cup or around the time that World Cup break started and brought Emery in, who is. An absolute one. He's top class. I've, I wanted him. I wanted him when when Roberto Martinez went. He was the one where I thought, if you've got proper ambition as a football club, you know when Mashiri come in, if you've got real ambition, he's the one you go and get, rather than you know getting someone who's done all right with Southampton or whatever else. He's the one that you really get. Now Villa, right time, right place for them. You know, obviously be, was burnt before at Arsenal. Maybe wasn't quite the right time. Um language barriers and, and stuff at the time he's bounced for, back from that brilliantly you know went into PSG come back to Spain done brilliantly well and I think a club like Villa suits him perfectly I think a club like Everton would suit him perfectly sadly that, that's obviously passed but I do believe that if someone came into Everton and did have the same ambitions that Villa have shown I don't get me wrong I think Villa also had better players when Emery took over 
And he's just built on that really, really well. And he's obviously helped the back four. But that's what that's what when you're looking, when you're talking about, when you're talking and you need that little bit of optimism, Villa are a brilliant example to go, look, look what they've done. Look, look what they've that the, you can do. If the fans are on board, whether you've got the right manager, you've got backing from your owners, and you're pushing in the right direction, it, you know, they, they are definitely the people that should be inspiring us if we can't get a takeover over the line in the next few months. Yeah, and you talk about the two clubs and there are a lot of similarities there because, you know, a very big club, Aston Villa, a very famous club that hadn't been winning things at the mm. same ratio that they might have done in the past. But obviously they've never lost sight of the fact that they are a big club with big expectations and mm. big goals. And they've not settled for, obviously they had that good run under Emery when he came in and they didn't settle for, OK, mm. we're out of relegation now and, you know, hopefully... We'll just keep doing that going forward and we can just be safety. Parlay that into signing more big players, making more big signings. But no, let's mm. take the next step now and let's climb the league table again because this is where we are as a club, but this is where we should be as a club at the very least because those are our standards. And I think it's easy to forget that sometimes in football because you can live through the years of fighting relegation and obviously we're all aware of what a bad thing that would be for any football club. So you can become used to just settling for surviving, mm. but... I think actually if you remember who you are as a football club and you remember where your football club should be in the world standards and you've got the money to facilitate that and you've got the staff at the club to facilitate that, then absolutely go for it. Yeah, and and it's a case of... It's also a case of doing it your way and not looking at what everyone else is doing. I mean, obviously that's where everything went wrong when Mercedes came in. They looked at what... Or they thought everyone else was doing it in terms of, you know, in terms of just going out and buying players, and it'll all, all work because you're buying good players and you buy, splash them out of money. With Emery, there seems to, and and he obviously brought Monchi and he's got all the, the whole club, I believe, and you know everything comes from his standards. It's that you can get older if you have real people who know what they're doing in in real positions of power in a football club. And Villa are, Villa are a big club. I, I, I obviously think they're very, very similar to Everton. You know, they've won a European Cup and should be very proud of that. We've won more league titles, so I don't know whether that balances out. But, you know, the grounds are quite similar as, as well. They've, they've got the room to build onto their new stadium. Um, I know that's a bit of a... I know at the moment they're not too happy with the ticket prices of uh, the Champions League games, and that's where the you know fans have a right to do that, absolutely. But... It is good to see a club who have been maybe told that they are not, aren't one of the elite anymore um, fighting back. So uh, they are a really, really good example. But on, on the pitch, they're obviously got, they've got a good side as well. Um, obviously, they came in and uh, took one of our players in the summer, um, Amadou Onana. Let's just look at his numbers so far at Aston Villa. Play three, two goals, um, XG of 1.11, uh, no assists, and an XA of 0.04. Um, and he's obviously talked a lot about going to Villa and the perfect move, and he's allowed to play football now. And I think we are seeing the kind of player he is. I know a lot of Evertonians aren't. They just aren't, aren't having them. They never had them when he when he hit the when he missed the penalty and all that kind of thing. They just weren't having them. But he's a, he, he's a really good player. They never have got to uh, you know watch out for him. Obviously off set pieces, but just the way he picks up the ball and moves it through the lines. Yeah, and regardless of what any of us might think about him in his time at Everton, I think one thing we could all agree on, regardless of how high you thought his ceiling was. It was never going to be realised under Sean Dyche, but no. it's just not the style of football that he's suited to. But we're seeing at Aston Villa, aren't we? And yes, it is only early days, but he's doing very well for them. And he's been a natural fit in that midfield under Emery, playing more progressive football. The big thing for me that he does in that midfield, though, is how he actually facilitates Yori Tielemans, mm. who's next to him. Because he's the big one for me in that midfield. And having O'Nana in there to do the dirty work at times almost yeah. and receive the ball off the defence... It frees up Tielemans so much. And if you watch Tielemans in Aston Villa's opening three fixtures, his delivery into the box has been crucial for Aston Villa. He's threaded some brilliant balls in behind for their attackers. And when you've got the attack and talent that they have and all the pace that they've got, 
that's key for them. Yeah. And I think having Onana there complements Tielemans perfectly mm. and they've almost got that perfect midfield balance now. Well, let's have a look at the team that beat uh, Leicester City away in the last time out. There's so much pace in that team. I know where uh, Leon Bailey's obviously a big doubt for this game. He went off injured against Leicester and uh, Konza went off when playing for England. So there's two who might be missing. But Ollie Watkins, Morgan Rogers, who's playing, been playing up there. Um, Giran coming off the bench. Bailey, if he's available. There's just so much pace in the team, and it's it's such an opposite to what to what we are in terms of you know going forward. They've got they've got so many options going forward, and then they've got the full backs, and obviously they've got Luca Dean uh, at, at left back, who's fought his way back into the side, um, having looked like he was going to leave, and the way they sort of they'll move over. You see John McGinn there on the on the wing, but he's not really. He plays more inside, and that allows Luca Dean to fly forward. And obviously, we 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 saw that um, when he played for us, and it's something you know we we don't have. But I, I just think the, the style of football and being good defensively as well has just helped them, um, as you said before, win so many games and get themselves into the position they are now. Yeah, and you're right, they have a lot of things that we don't have, but we've got to look at what we do have if we're going to look at a result from this game mm. and. Obviously, they've got a lot, lot of attack and talent. Everton, as a team, don't defend that high up the pitch. We do sit back a lot further than yeah. most teams do. And obviously, that leaves us wanting going forward. Yeah. But what it does give us in this specific fixture, actually, is the advantage of not having to change our style to adapt mm. to their threat. So if you look at where a lot of their goals have came from in the opening stages of the season, it's by having those overlapping full-backs going into that space beyond the wingers who do come inside and then being able to whip balls round the back of the defence. Yeah. Obviously, Yori Tielemans as well, trying to slot them through the middle. Because we aren't that high up the pitch, yeah. we leave less space in behind for them to try and yeah. have that success with the delivery. Yeah. I mean, one thing I have noticed from their last game as well, and I think this is going to have to be a, a major tactical point for the game, is they made five subs. And as we know, that's like kryptonite to Everton. Um, so it's going to be... But that, but but the bench, the bench, you know, the likes of Jacob Ramsey, Jaran, as I mentioned, Ross Barkley now, um, Matt Matson, they've they've got they've started building the the, the bench out as well and um, getting a stronger squad and it is important and it's something that we saw in our last game that whether Sean Dyche believes it or not the game is changing. I know it's only been for the last couple of years now, or three years, with the five subs, and I know a lot of people, and I'm sure Sean Dyche. Well, I believe Sean Dyche was very. Sean Dyche was actually, I think, one of the major people who didn't want five subs when they were trying to bring it in, because I remember there was a little bit of a spat between him and Klopp, wasn't there? Hmm. Um, but you have to move with the times, and if if clubs are bringing, you know, if clubs are bringing them on in the last game, they made subs. Two subs around the hour mark. He'd made one early on when Ramsey went off. Uh, sorry, when Bailey went off for Ramsey, and then Ramsey himself went off with ten minutes to go. He made three subs with ten minutes to go. Again, game goes on for eight, 95, 96, 97 minutes now. So he's making subs with fifteen minutes to go. Three subs. That can make that can be that can be so important. And certainly in that game for Le uh, for Villa against Leicester, they were winning two one. So he's brought three subs on to protect that lead in many ways. Now whether you know you look, you can look at it either way, whether they're offensive or defensive, it's still protecting the lead. And that, I think, you know, I know. Listen, I know that people have different opinions, and Sean Dice very much. He said himself, he's, he's he, he rewatched the game forty-seven times. But I'm per, my personal opinion is, if you fret, if you freshen it up and you bring on the right subs that are sitting on your bench, it's going to help your team rather than players who are um, struggling and on a very hot day, Goodison Park as well. So um, if Villa are going to have a squad and they're going to use that squad and Everton have to hope they can match up to that on the day. Yeah, you move to cover yourself, don't you? Even if you're performing all right out there and even if there isn't massive tiredness yeah. in your team, if they make a substitution, they've automatically got more energy and more fitness than you. And it's just about moving to cover yourself mm. and preventing problems rather than reacting to them. Let's have a little look at uh, Everton's team, obviously, that was beaten by Bournemouth in the last game. And obviously... Uh, we're not sure whether Seamus is going to be available after after going off against Ireland. Obviously, you've got Michael Keane, 
And Taki centre backs who've not really covered themselves in much glory, conceding ten goals. Um, do you think you know Mangala's available? Manager has said that. Do you, James Garner uh, is available. Can you see or what do you think are the likely changes to this game? I think we could see an argument for James Garner coming in in midfield. Mangala, I think he's not been with the squad at all. Yeah. As he, he's been away on international duty, obviously. But James Garner, for me, is the interesting one. Partly because I look at Tim Eric Boonham's performance away at Tottenham mm -hmm. the other week. And, you know, Eric Boonham's been great for us at Goodison Park. And he's a player that I'm really fond of. I think yeah, he's yeah. going to continue doing great things for us. But he's a young player, which means he has things left to learn. And... I thought, although it's only one game, he struggled with his positional sense mm. away at Tottenham. And looking at this Aston Villa team and some of the success they've been having in their opening games comes from Morgan Rodgers picking up the ball and driving through the middle yeah. when he's had space to. And I think one thing we can't afford at Aston Villa is space in the middle of the park yeah. to run into with the ball. So, And then you have Eric Boonham on the bench as an option for the last half an hour to bring on. He's got that energy then. It's just about using your squad to fit the game. Obviously, in terms of his performance as a home, he deserves a spot in that team. There's no argument to be had there. Mm. But if you look at what he might potentially be lacking in his game just through a lack of experience, mm. I think you've got to move to address that. And James Garner's the natural choice there. See, I thought you were going to say James Garner at right-back. Well, that's the other thing. I think he would be a good argue argument to have at right-back because Ashley Young, you mentioned the Villa game last mm. season, and it was Ashley Young and Michael Keane who specifically didn't have the best days. We know yeah. Keane's going to be playing. That's just the way it is with this manager. But James Garner, for me, is an option that should be considered at right-back. Mm. Even once Seamus and Patterson are back, I think... We have got depth in midfield now where we have the option to play Garner elsewhere mm. and he's played right back before in big games for us and done well. But I think in this game specifically, he might be needed more in midfield. It's interesting because you're saying that because you've got the likes of Indai as well. Uh, who people or the manager saying it might look at and go for an away game. But I I think Indai's perfect for an away game. Mm. I think he's the person for me that if you're not going to have a lot of the possession that you want to pick up the ball and drive at them and, and cover the ground and maybe get the get a few fouls for you and also take the pressure off the back four or you know by having having someone who carries it. So it's interesting. I don't know what dropping Tim in a boom, I don't know if what that would do to him mentally. I mean he's already said this week that the manager just said go out there and run around a bit. So uh, maybe a bit more instruction might might help but well, he's already played more football than he was probably expecting. No, I just mean going back knew. to your old club and, and wanting to impress and whether that might be. Sometimes, I think a manager, sometimes their work can be done by them. Just go by just grabbing all of them, going, go and show them what they're missing out on. Mm. You know, that's a very old school way of looking at things, but Sean Dice does do things in a very old school way. Uh, before we go on, let's have a little look at the uh, match pack for the game. This Saturday at Villa Park, Aston Villa take on Everton in the Premier League. Everton and Aston Villa is the most played fixture in top flight history. Everton have won 83 of their games against Aston Villa, lost 87 and drawn 61. So far this season, Everton sit 20th in the league. They've won 0 games, drawn 0 games and lost 3. Their heaviest defeat being a 4-0 defeat at Spurs. Aston Villa sit 7th, they've won 2, drawn 0 and lost 1. Aston Villa's joint top scorer this season is John Duran with two goals and Amadou Unana who formerly played for the Toffees. Dominic Calvert-Lewin and Michael Keane share one goal each this season for the Toffees. The two league meetings last season ended at a 4-0 defeat for Everton at Villa Park and a 0-0 draw at Goodison Park, although Everton did beat Aston Villa 2-1 in the League Cup at Villa Park. So obviously, as I said, it is the most played fixture in English football. I think both clubs should be proud of that, that... That that does illustrate that both club, both big big clubs, and um, as we said before, Villa are an example. But just to wrap up, I think listen, it's the fourth game of the season. First, you know, back after an international break. Sometimes you don't get your players back um, till a couple of days before. You know, Villa would have had a lot away. I think we've had seven senior away this week. I think what I'd like to see is Everton approach this game. 100% differently than the approach Spurs. And that, to me, is on the players. No matter what the instructions are from the manager, at least go out there and believe in it. Because to me, when we went to Spurs, for our, obviously our other away game, 
I looked at a team that just did not believe in what they'd been asked to do that day. And I just think that whether you like the manager or you don't like the manager, you have to believe that he knows what he's doing. Listen, if he doesn't and it all falls apart, that's not on you as a player if you've gone out there and done everything in your power and executed the plan to the best you can. Then there's no excuses. There are no excuses then. Then no one can say, well, it was on the players. You go out and give everything and the plan's just not good enough or you're not good enough. At least you can walk off the pitch with your head held high. And you know what? Some days it is enough. But if you walk out there and you don't believe in it and you don't give it everything, then you will 100% get beat. So as long as they do that on Saturday and believe in what they're doing, I'm not saying I'd be happy, but I'd be a lot happier than if I see what I saw at Spurs, which was players who just just went out there and went, let's keep the score down, lads. So that that's on that that part of it is on the players for me. Yeah, you have to go and give it a go, don't you? And as good as they are, they'll have weaknesses. Every team mm-hmm. in the world has weaknesses. And, you know, you could look at their fullbacks, for example, and how high they push up the pitch. And there could be a potential opening for us to get in behind. But it's going to take alertness. Mm-hmm. It's going to take the players working hard to get into them spaces yeah. and working hard to get back in position if it doesn't yeah. work. So maximum effort is the minimum requirement, as the manager Oof. would say. Oof! I think we've got a convert here. There you go. Uh, let us know your thoughts in the comments. How do you feel going into this game? And what what does it mean? What does a defeat mean if we were to get, get beat? What does it mean for everything? Let, let us know your thoughts in the comments. Make sure to check out Start 11 show as well. And uh, obviously after the game, me and Baz will be doing uh, all our reactions to the game. Thanks for watching. Give it a like, subscribe if you haven't already. If you want more great videos, check us out. Toffee TV Premier, link is in the description. QR codes come up on the screen now. See you later.